about this for hours. Um, for those that weren't late, I'm like getting over like a little throat thing. So apologies if my voice cracks and stuff like that. Um, but yo, so as you guys read, the theme for today is uh, we're going to talk about a few different things with a very special guest. Um, among them, how to get booked, how to throw parties, and do a little bit of a dive on production. Um, and we only have, you know, 90 minutes or so. Um, we'll have time for questions and answers at the very end. Um, but also for anyone who feels like this ended too abruptly, um, in a few weeks, I'm going to do uh, a, another free music uh, sort of like challenge thing. And uh, I just dropped a link for anyone who wants to RSCP. I'll drop it like a few times. That way, like, there you go. I just mashed it. That way, if it gets lost in the chat, you can try to find it. Um, that's just like an RSVP link so I can kind of get a sense of how many people want to roll through. But um, this is not the end. And just I around the holidays, it's like a time where I can like slow down on touring a little bit and do some of this stuff. And it's just the most fun. So I have a very, very special guest today. He is one of my closest friends in the music industry, someone who I feel like he's like my big brother. Um, and he is he's been one of my biggest mentors. He is an artist that I have played so much of his music in my DJ sets over the years. And he is also, uh, he is a really amazing promoter in Denver, does an insane amount of stuff. And he also, about 10 years ago, booked me for my first show in Denver when I was 19, underage, <laughs> snuck me into the club, and is, we have been best friends like um, you know collaborators dj together like ever since and um i want all of you guys briefly unmute your mics make some noise for my friend brennan aka option four Woo! let's go hey. oh. 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 Hey, brennan. Yeah. Yeah. Boy. yeah boy awesome awesome thank you guys are the one <laughs> um i just muted everyone brennan you might need to unmute yourself um it's just the, the <laughs> chaos dude how are you doing dude doing really good man i'm excited to be here um you make me sound so much cooler than i am so thank you for that <laughs> <laughs> of course dude um and also yeah just just a quick question like um to give people like a sense of what you do what can you give people a little shout out of like what parties you're you're doing like this weekend do you do you know off the top of your head <laughs> oh um Ah, uh, this weekend, um, a lot. Um, uh, right off the top of my head, you put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> tonight, uh, tonight I have my little steam party, which is like one of my favorite parties. That's uh, uh, this little local party that I do every week. Um, that is like a midweek party, and it's something we've been doing for years in Denver, and it's kind of transformed now to be like almost like a local hang where we have lots of DJs locally all come play and it's multiple rooms in different genres. Um, and then tomorrow I have Lazewo at the summit and then Stefan Joke at, or Yoke, I don't know how to pronounce it, at 1134. And then Young Bay at the church. And then Saturday, oh, I got Minnesota at Meow Wolf on Friday. And then I have Minnesota again at Meow Wolf on Saturday, and then Co Factor at Vinyl on Saturday, and then Yulia Nico at 11:34 on Saturday. And okay. I'm not sure. If I'm <laughs> All sure. right, so yeah, you uh, people in the chat can get it. This is like, but this is like every weekend. It's uh, Brennan. He likes. I've heard him say like you're not a real promoter until you're booking multiple shows the same night and competing against yourself. Right. Um, but so, you know, Brennan, you know, he does like all this insane stuff. Um, one thing that I want to circle back on real quick, cause I think it's so cool to just show like where his head's at as a promoter, this steam party that you do. Um, so it's multiple rooms, several artists per room, and it's mostly local homies. Right. And isn't it kind of like, a community driven event uh yeah it's like a i mean it started it started as like uh being in denver it was like um a midweek party which was really important like eight years ago uh when we started it because like being in the middle of the country and being like a small market it was like the only chance we had to book big names because we didn't have to 
um, compete with like the pricing for the big names that they would normally get on the weekends where they play the big markets. So they, we were able to book shows or I was able to book shows for these really big artists to come play in um, Denver in the middle of the country for a lot less money because I could never afford to pay them what they would make on the weekends in say LA or New York. So that midweek hub turned into this little steam party on Wednesdays and that started just once a week and I would book everybody from Kay Trinata to Jamie XX to Rufus Dussault to Fisher to you name it. And that party has now kept going now for eight years. It's kind of crazy <laughs> to think about that. Uh, now it's like with all of the other shows in the market has and and just the amount of shows that have grown and the amount of parties that are happening in the city now, it's now transformed into something where I use Steam as something where we bring like national talent in like once a month and I try to give that platform now to more locals. So now it's like this communal hang where all the different genres and uh, that have come out past the, when the pandemic hit. Now it's like we have like a breaks room and we have a techno room and we have a disco room and then we have a house room and then that then just offers like more opportunities for all these artists to play the genres that they love and then we mix it up every week so it's like a chance to book like 20 artists a week as opposed to just like having one room with just one sound getting getting pushed that week so awesome so awesome <laughs> so you know i just uh, thank you for like being down to be put on the spot i just wanted to give people here a sense of like what you're up to today and a um, little bit of an agenda for today. I put together like a very silly PowerPoint presentation that I came up with for like how to get booked. I ran it by Brennan to get his thoughts too. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how Brennan got to where he is now. And his story is literally one of my favorite stories that I've ever heard in the, you know, like American dance music scene. It's so inspiring. He literally started from nothing and is now like built this community, this scene. And he did it in the most like, just uh, like community driven way from a place of love for this music. And uh, it's just so awesome. So before, and then uh, to conclude, Brendan and I have also made a bunch of music together. We just put out a new song um, and we're going to do a little production breakdown um, because at the end of the day, we can talk about all this, like, you know, industry stuff, you know, how to get booked and whatnot, but all that matters at the end of the day is music, you know, in terms of just like, for me, for Brennan, just like why we love it, it is about the music. And without it, like we wouldn't really be doing this. You know, it's why we love it so much. So that's a little overview of what we got planned. Um, and let's dive in with like a very cheeky slideshow. Um, let's see how this goes. I don't normally do slideshows, but let me do. How do I do this slideshow? Boom. OK, cool. And here we go. How to get booked. <laughs> <laughs> all you need is a uh a cool hat <laughs> like look at brendan he's got a cool hat he's ready <laughs> all right how to get booked so there's a couple of different ways um and i'll just run through all of them have an agent an agent is someone who would like facilitate your bookings and obviously a lot of people here be like dude how do you get an agent let's keep it going promoter reaches out to you so this could be the Maybe you're putting out music and you just get a, a DM or like an email <clears throat> from someone who throws parties and just reaches out to you to play a show. Third is you reaching out to the promoter. You saying like, hey, I would love to DJ your party. Here's maybe some, uh, some music or a mix. Um, please book me. <laughs> and four, throw your own event. So obviously this is like super, super simplified, but I feel like it's, you know, worth just kind of breaking it down, making it as simple as possible um, because uh, it doesn't need to be complicated. And I feel like if it's simple, you can try to take action to, you know, get booked if you want to DJ. All right. So um, in these three things, if you to get an agent, to get promoters to reach out to you, to get promoters to say yes when you reach out, there are only really three fundamental factors that help make any of these things happen. First and most important is your music. Um, we can go and I'll be going into greater detail in all of these, but you know, producing music, if you have recorded sets, DJing, just you know, obviously that's what this is all about. Um, the next would be selling tickets or bringing people. Um, you know. 
Brennan, you, you put, you mentioned, I, I love that we were talking about this the other day and you mentioned you like knowing how a venue runs and operates. Could you speak a little bit about like <laughs> the financial side of like this, this, what makes up an event or a venue or a party sustainable, you know, like the bartenders and all the staff, you know, what goes into it? Well, yeah, like ultimately like that's, that's a, you know, there's different levels to that too. Like, you know, um, and this happens on the small level all the way up to the big level, but like when deals get struck for, for venue artists to play venues, um, on the high level, it's the artist gets paid dependent on the amount of tickets the artist is worth to, to play the venue. And so that can happen on the small level too, if it's like, you know, your first local show, um, or your first gig, if you're opening up for an artist, you're going to be, you know, um, there's this gray area that exists where, you know, there's this myth that, I don't know, it's like an internet thing that happens where, like, oftentimes, like, the idea is that, like, uh, a promoter will pay uh, a DJ in exposure, right? That's, like, a thing that gets ha that happens all the time where it's like, oh, no, we'll give you this good look. Um, if, if that is, the, the, the way this works is this, like, if the artist that's the headliner is selling all the tickets, right, and they are, they say that the show is sold out and they don't need the support to help push the show or promote the show, then technically the value of those artists underneath the bill is not very high because the tickets are already sold. The event's already done. It's already, it's already done. Um, however, when it comes to, um, like, a local artist, if you get booked for a show and you show up and you sell tickets and you demonstrate that your value is strong because you brought a lot of people and a lot of people came to see what you did and, and came to see your performance, then your value should be dictated and compensated accordingly. So for example, like if you come to a, if you get booked for whatever gig, I don't care what it is, say you get, you get booked for a show and the promoter's like, I paid you hundred bucks, 200 bucks to come play, 150 bucks to come play this show. And all of a sudden, you know, 150 people came and paid $20 to come see you play. The revenue there ends up being like, we'll say $2,000. So your compensation was not equally paid. If you were paid $200 and you brought $2,000 with the tickets, then that needs to be renegotiated on the next play. However, if you go to perform and no one comes to see you or you did not promote or no one cared and no one cared to buy a ticket then you know what your value is on that side of things so it's like your your value in the market no matter if you're playing a touring show or you're playing a local show or whatever gig your your technical value is what you how many tip how many people will come to pay to see you play and that can differ on any type of any type of scale period and, and to get in there, like, you know, I think one of the things you mentioned to me the other night was like, you know, this, this sort of idea of like selling tickets and bringing people, especially for established venues and stuff, it's so important for the ecosystem because if a venue is empty and it's holding a night, then the bartenders aren't going to get tips. The venue might not be able to pay its rent. The venue might then go out of business and might not be able to continue throwing parties. So it's, it is, you know, this idea of like bringing people to the night, it is a big focal point and it is like important for like just the way that things work um, for, you know, whether it's a warehouse party, which promoters can take a huge risk to like get a space, get speakers. And if no one comes, they can lose a lot of money. Um, same with like real venues where they have to pay their rent. Um so that's that's sort of why this idea of like selling tickets and bringing people is so important for the sustainability of throwing events um and why if you can bring people to a show uh that's just an incredible you know sort of thing for for everybody um the last would be personal relationships um and we're going to talk in greater detail about all of these things. So let's keep it going. So music, um, how can you get your music heard by a promoter in, you know, sort of peak interest from a, uh, an agent, that sort of thing. So uh, you can send your music directly to anyone, whether it's a record label, DJs, or to promoters. Um, and so that's, you know, to not be afraid to shoot your shot, send some music out there, be like, hey, I love your party. 
<laughs> you, you, if you legitimately go to this party, um, you know, maybe regularly, if you're kind of like embedded in your local scene, you know, I feel like you can, you know, come from a very like authentic place and reach out to, you know, the promoter who's thrown the stuff, send some music. Um, you can do the same through record labels, through DJs. And these are like great ways to, um, yeah, get noticed, get attention. <clears throat> a lot of people can get discovered through SoundCloud. I'm a big fan of like these hyped, hyped it, hype edit, whatever you however you pronounce it, um, like free download things. Um, I've discovered so many amazing artists that I absolutely love that I then like pay, you know, pay a ticket to go see them play. Like I still love going to shows and love seeing music that <laughs> speaks to my heart. Um, SoundCloud, such a great platform. It's weird because in like, like 10 years ago, it was huge. Then it kind of died. Then it came back. It's now back and can be such a great platform um, for getting your music out there and is great even when you're not hearing back from the labels and not hearing back from other DJs. Same thing with Bandcamp. Um, same thing with Spotify. Social media is like another one. Um, some artists are really good at it. Some artists are not. For the longest time, I've been really uh, shy and sort of like, ugh, um, I don't know, <laughs> uninspired by social media. But recently, I just started trying to film myself DJ, um, which is something I actually love doing. And then I can just like post little clips of me DJ. And yeah, uh, if you, the key way to use social media to like reach new people is with videos, um, TikTok, obviously everyone talks about it. And IG reels are also good. Um, let's keep it rolling. Selling tickets. So if you have fans, maybe people have been hearing your music, friends. Um, if someone has a birthday, if you have a friend who has a birthday, that's like one of the best ways to throw a party, especially like I'm not the most social person in my group of friends. Generally, I'm pretty introverted and shy, but you know, if someone, if, if, you know, if you have a friend who's like, you know, sort of like the social one and the outgoing one and likes to celebrate their birthday, um, the birthday party, I think is a phenomenal <laughs> approach, um, to like getting a bunch of people together and playing some music and celebrating that friend. Um, then there's also hustling, which, uh, Brennan could probably tell you way more about, and he certainly will in, in the story of how he built his whole, uh, sort of like scene um, in Denver. Uh, personal relationships, you can connect online or in person, sh just shooting a message, just going up to someone. You can, and I feel like realizing that you, if they're a promoter that throws parties that you love to attend and have, they have DJs that you love, like you obviously have this shared love for music and that I think should be a really authentic, genuine source of connection and um, just know that I don't like to think of this as networking. It's just like finding kindred spirits, like connecting with people who like you actually like relate to, um, on a deep level. Um, that's how I feel about it. Um, and then a third thing, you know, especially from promoters, can you help them? Because being a promoter is hard getting people to a party. If it's a warehouse party, there's so many things that could go wrong and so many things that need to be done. Personally, I think throwing parties can be quite difficult. Other people are good at it. And it's one of those things where the more hands on deck, the the better. And, you know, if you're just, if you're hungry and you want to help, um, it's not that you have to do that, but it is uh, definitely a route that can be taken. Um, the final thing is throw your own event. Um, this is if you don't want to do any of these other things, or if maybe you're getting stuck. If you're getting stuck with all those things, that might not mean that you are a bad artist or a bad DJ. It might mean you haven't found the right place for your music or the right promoter for your parties. And in that case, you just need DJ equipment, sound system, a space location, and some friends. This can sound like a lot, but it doesn't need to be. It can be like, I have a bunch of friends, shout out the homies they have in LA. They have a label called Quirk, Q-W-E-R-K. And they just started throwing these park parties. They're super fun and the location is free. One of them has DJ equipment. Maybe the other has like speakers and they just have a good group of friends and it's awesome. Another uh, great example of this is Dirty Bird Records, how it's... <laughs> they have an easy app, CDJs, put it in a park, free party. Uh, they had barbecue. It kind of like grew um, more and more as like 
people did it, but it just started just like as a fun party with friends for the love of music. They were interested in a style of music that no one else really seemed to like. Um, they were doing their own thing and what seemed like a challenge, maybe they weren't getting asked to DJ in clubs. They threw their own party and it grew and grew and grew because it was different, because it didn't fit anywhere else. People heard it and were like, wow, this is super cool and fun and just great people, good vibes. So that is the end of this slideshow. <laughs> um, and I'm curious, like here, I'm going to switch views so I can like look at people. Give me, give me, a, use your thumbs. Give me two thumbs up if you felt like this is useful in some way and it's okay if not. <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. My hope, sweet, sweet. For anyone who's like, you know what? That was all very obvious. I don't feel like I have any, I'm no, I'm not one step closer to actually taking action. That is super fair. Um, if you think that you're like in an uphill, insurmountable experience, let's say there's no scene. Let's say there's no one who like likes the same kind of music as you. I think that's the perfect segue to talk about how <laughs> Brennan option for his journey with um how he built a scene for house music in Denver when he felt that his the the music that he loved was not represented. Um so Brennan, dude, you ready to talk about the story of the hundred? Uh yeah, sure. Um geez, what is that? Quick question. Crazy. Hit. Dude, so I guess, you know, I think also like a good, uh, a good, a good side note. Brennan, as like an artist, I feel like he's old. <laughs> Every time there's been a challenge, he's never given up. Um, he, like <laughs> Brennan, when you, uh, when did you first like want to give up on your career as a DJ? How old are you? <laughs> How many times? I don't know. I feel like I'm, that's just a never-ending. That's like this. That's. <laughs> such an open-ended question um ah man well I so when I like when I, when I first started DJing I was like I I grew up in a small town um I grew up in San Francisco but then when I moved um when I was a teenager I moved to Colorado Springs I'm a dinosaur and so the music that I was privy to or that was accessible to me I didn't learn about electronic music because so I was uh, like I was young and the music that I had access to like the first time I started hearing electronic music I was like 16 years old and so like the first like rave I went to um was actually Chemical Brothers uh at Red Rocks I was 16 and I went to that show blew my mind then I was like I love electronic music for the rest of my life that's all I ever want to go to and so um I started learning how to DJ when I was a little older than that maybe 17, I, I bought my first pair of turntables and I went to the little record store in Colorado Springs when I was going to high school there. And so I was like, I just would save up and buy records and I was kind of buying very accessible, like progressive trance. And then um, the guy at the record store kind of took a liking to me because I'd save up my money and I'd go on Fridays to go to the record store and I had a little cubby. Like I would be like, I don't have the money for these records yet. Save them for me. I'll come back next week when I get paid. I'll buy the next couple of records. And like, that's what I did. But he took a lot of me and he finally started showing me a lot deeper, cooler music. And so that's when I kind of like got introduced to house music. So um, being the only kid in the, probably in the whole city, to be honest, I don't know, that had turntables. Um, I would be the DJ, like I, I'd be the one that played the house parties and played like I never played a club until I was like 25 years old. And so um, I would play all the parties and all I had was house music. And so I grew up thinking I was just the worst DJ of all time because no one liked any of the music that I played because I never had any music that anybody ever knew. Like everything was always like, what's the request? And I never got to play any cool parties. And so um, like when I was uh, like 25, or or so um i went to play this house party um and i s overslept and my records were in my car <laughs> in the trunk because i locked them in the trunk and i overslept and it was in the summertime and i went home and i put a record on to go take a shower and i just realized that the sun had warped my like best creative records and so at that point i was just like Everybody hates me as a DJ. No one's ever like, like I play the worst sets. <laughs> and, 
and I just lost all of my good records and I don't want to do this anymore. So that was, <laughs> I mean, the first time I gave up. <laughs> and then, and then a few years later you got into producing music and you were like putting stuff up on my, MySpace. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's what kind of got me back into it. It was like a, um, I had like a, a song go viral on MySpace and people like my music again. And uh, that was like the most mind blowing thing in the world to me. And it was like some of the bigger names at the time that I didn't know were big names that were hitting me up on MySpace that were playing my record. Um, and they were actually playing in like clubs because like electronic music, like that sort of music wasn't getting played anywhere. It wasn't really getting played at the clubs. Like the clubs were like kind of top 40 clubs just across the country. Like house music especially was just at an all time low in America at that time. But uh, it wasn't until like I saw festivals and I saw the names on the festival bills that I saw, the, I was so out of touch with like the music scene. I saw these big names and I'm like, oh my God, you were hitting me up on MySpace playing my songs. And so then I created this like cacophony in my head where I was just like, oh my God, I was like hitting them back up on MySpace and they were ignoring me. And I was just like, Dippo, you remember me? You <laughs> and you like that song from two years ago. <laughs> and, and, and while this was happening, while you were like putting out songs on MySpace, like what were you juggling in your life? <laughs> Oh, I was just, I, I was just working a lot. I had a, a full-time day job. I was, uh, I was building cell phone towers. So I was working like a hundred hours a week. So when it, I was like in isolation mode. So I would like work in the hotel room, making music and making beats. And that was like my hobby at the time. And so I would be on the road. So I didn't know a whole lot of people in the cities that I was working in. But at night when the other guys would like go to the strip club or something, I would, I would stay in my hotel room and just like, you know, make deep house beats, baby. <laughs> dude crazy and you said you were working like a hundred hour weeks how did you like have energy to make music while like doing while working like pretty like physically demanding like crazy it, like stuff right <laughs> it was only like usually like an hour or two at night just uh -huh. like at the end of the days it was like the only time only free time i had but like i said it was the only thing i was able to do because i didn't have any friends i'd be in like Hayes, Kansas or something like that. And so I just go back to the hotel room and I'd make records and keep playing around with Reason. Reason really kind of changed my life. It was like, uh, you know, um, it helped me learn a lot about making music. And it was like, ended up being like my my biggest hobby. It's dude, insane. Like, seriously, to, I mean, just have, you know, I, I feel like it's so easy to like get home from a long day and not have the energy to make music. But it, to me, it just sounds like it was like your source of fun, right? It was the only thing that, yeah, it was the only thing I had to do. I was in the middle of nowhere all the time. But it, <laughs> it was like a, it was a lot of fun to see like the internet react to the music, right? Mm -hmm. So when the play counts would go up and stuff. Um, and that was before the SoundCloud era and stuff. But it was like, it gave me, you know, encouragement to kind of keep making music. And then when I saw the bigger DJs actually start touring and then clubs actually start booking, you know, uh dance music that was just mind-boggling to me so it was just like whoa things are becoming real like 2008 i was just like holy shit you could dance like clothes were looking dance music and you could go you go see electronic music in venues that was just like unheard of in 2005 dude and so however it, it seems like when you were doing this like you you started throwing parties a few years later and it seemed like, it seemed like, did you hit, it feels like you were like hitting some roadblocks in this era. Like what was the, can you paint the picture for, for what, why did you like need to start throwing parties yourself? Like four, five years later. Well, like I, I finally, like I was, I, I was at a point where my, um, my personal situation with my family, I didn't really need to provide for my family as much anymore. And it was like, I've been working in a corporate life and working like so many hours for so long, majority of my twenties, I was 29 years old before I became like a real promoter or decided to just quit everything and become a promoter. And that happened overnight. I, I was like, you know what? Music's the only thing that ever made, that really made me happy. I'm just gonna quit and be a DJ. And so I moved to Denver and um, I had this little residency where I made $150 a week. And I had a little bit of money saved up in my account, not much. And uh, after making like $100, $150 a week for like two weeks, I was like, well, I'm making music, I'm producing records, and I'm playing the records, and I have my little residency, but I got to figure out another way of, of, of income, and I got to figure out um, 
ultimately had to kind of create the parties that I wanted to play the music that I wanted to play. Like the the gatekeeping in that world back then, and and this is probably very similar to a lot of the markets in America right now. Um, there might be one or two parties that are happening in your city, but they have re- they have like residencies, and so there's never ever a chance to play those parties. And that's the way it was in Denver back then. So like there were dance music parties that were happening. There were like two in the city. They weren't really doing house music at all. But if I ever wanted, like I, I tried several times to just be like, here's my USB. Here's like, I tried to meet the promoters, the DJs. I'd go to the show, I'd support. I was there all the time. I was just like, you know, I'd love to get an opening slot like nine o'clock. I'd love to, I'd love to play. I'd love to, I'd love to promote. I'd love to, you know, just play on the sound system. And it was just constantly denied because they were protecting their own little residencies. And those people played the same show every single week. And so Ultimately, after enough of that, I was like, well, I'm going to start my own party and I'm going to play house music because that's what I want to do. So that's when I started The 100 and um, started my throwing my own parties. And what is The 100? What was the concept? How did you build it? Well, ultimately, and this is something that can happen anywhere, um, but I I basically... I had, I had read this like nerd book um, and it's it's actually a show on Amazon now. It's like the Wheel of Time. Um, I, I, I was reading, I read a lot of books while I was climbing towers. Um, it was uh, this series called the Wheel of Time and it was about, <laughs> it was about this, uh, this like good wizard versus this bad wizard and he needed a hundred good wizards to fight the bad wizard. And so it, it ultimately was like about uh, uh, combining like a hundred people in a group to accomplish a goal. And so I came up with this concept where I was like, you know, um, I wanted to try and figure out how to organize a group of people with one common goal. And that was to bring music that wasn't getting brought to the city. And uh, that was like, you know, the first, that was the, the ultimate, the ultimate goal. And then the idea was, okay, let's figure out the building blocks to achieve that. So breaking everything down into its building blocks, it was like, all right, well, what's the most important pieces of that, of that, of that puzzle? And so it would be number one, identify the people that you want to party with. And so for me, that was people that cared about music. So how do you find people that care about music? For me, that was going to the shows early because the people that were going to the shows early were A, people that did their research and wanted to see the opening acts or B, people that were, I don't know, in relationships or friends with the acts. C, people that were like, I paid 20 bucks and I want five hours of music. <laughs> and, and, and so those are the people that I tried to identify with uh, the most, or bloggers, people, that was like a thing back then for sure. And so the, 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 the way I approached it is I would go to the shows early and I'd walk up to strangers and I'd be like, hi, my name's Brennan, I got this idea, uh, how would you like to book your own show? And so I'd walk up to strangers and I'd say, I'd like to buy you a drink. And most of the people, I was like, you know, 29 at the time, walking up to people. So I was like, creepy. So half the people ignore me. The other half of the people would be like, sure, I'll take a free drink. And I'd take it to the bar. I'd be like, um, what kind of music do you like? Why are you here? And if the people were like, oh, I love the opening act. I, I heard them on this and this and this. Those are the people that I was like, wow, you're going to be uh, somebody that I want to identify with. You're going to give shit about music. So um, I was like, I got this secret website. Um, I'm going to throw this, the, this, the series of parties. I found this dive bar that was dead. that had no business. So they were willing to give me a shot on a Saturday night to throw a party once a month. And I let these people in this secret group that had this little, uh, bulletin board and I gave them a number and all of a sudden, um, I let them in free to the parties, but I let them also have a say in what they wanted to book. And I didn't have a tremendous amount of money, of course, at the time. But the rule was we were only going to book people to play Denver that had never been here before. So all of a sudden, all these people are digging through all this music and they're showing links on SoundCloud and they're exchanging stuff. And we would just vote on what what was available and what we could try and bring. And so uh, that's how you came about, Justin. You know, we we looked, we found you online and we were like, oh, we should bring Justin J. And everybody's like, yeah, it's the hype new kid on Dirty Bird. Sweet. We're going to bring Justin for the first time. Um, we did the same thing with 
uh, Disclosure, fucking, you know, um, Kate Trinata, uh, Lane Inc., um, you know, everybody at that time on SoundCloud, it just started becoming this thing. And, you know, um, what ended up, the coolest thing that happened, it was not something I anticipated, but what ended like, uh, like transpiring was when people were coming to the, you know, to the parties, I went to the, you know, I went to the, um, mountains and I went to a metal manufacturing um, company and I got these metal tags and they were all stamped with the individual number. And so um, before the first party happened, people were calling and hitting me up and be like, look, my friend loves this idea. I told him about it. He would be perfect. He runs a blog. He's a huge music fanatic. He digs for music all the time. Like he would like to talk to you on the phone and maybe he gets a spot. And so I was talking, I was taking phone calls, explaining the concept. And then all of a sudden, like the hundred was full before the first party ever happened. And I didn't know almost anybody that was in the hundred until the first party. And so it kind of caught on like wildfire. And what I didn't know was going to happen was the first show that took place at like 930, there was a hundred people there that had all told all their friends. They had all hyped up the very first act that we had ever brought. And by 10 o'clock in a 230 cap room, we were completely full at doors and you could not move. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting here being like, hi, my name is Brennan. Nice to meet you, Jennifer. Your tag number 77. Nice to meet you. Hi, your number, whatever. And then the, the steam had been built for the next show beyond belief. By the next month, we brought in the next act. I did not sell out a party for the first year and a half. The first time I didn't sell out a show, I thought the 100 was over. And I was like, oh, my God, everything's the, the ceiling's, you know, falling, falling apart. Um, and so it was like a, it was a very, um, interesting, like, um, interesting, like, uh, uh, trend, like what transpired, but the interesting, like, um, repercussions of it was when we had our party at that empty dive bar that no one was going to, you now had a hundred people that were bonded with this thing. And so they all became friends and their friends became friends. And what that did was it almost created this like safety circle. It almost created the safety circle at the club, which was really cool. So now there weren't like creepers like allowed at the party. If anything was weird, people were looking out for one another. And that was like this mind blowing, cool consequence that that existed through this community that instantly popped up out of nowhere. And then we were able to not only take small acts that never had a chance to play Denver before or never had a chance to sell tickets in Colorado before and instantly skyrocket their careers. So that's part of the reason in Denver that you see a lot of these big names sell out Red Rocks now and are touring Red Rocks and can't sell that many tickets in say other markets in, in the country because 10 years ago they started playing 100 parties and they just spiraled out of control and grew these massive fan bases. So that's kind of how the hundred started and um you know i guess the rest is all kind of history dude so sick so inspiring i remember you know being 19 you telling me about this it was like i played maybe within the first year or two um and was just like wow this is the coolest thing ever it's like out of a movie or something uh dude by the way i love seeing the comments people be like the lore is too good <laughs> um <laughs> yeah, <we're called laughs> the wheel of time baby <laughs> culture wizard <laughs> <laughs> dude it's so awesome yeah the chat's blown up really awesome to see um and yeah it's just so crazy how like i don't know this idea of like going to the show early <laughs> going to other people's shows early and meeting the people who go at 9 p.m to like try to find some like like-minded individuals and to then bring everyone together in this way that is so about the music and you know it's like you you get a bunch of people who are passionate about music together and they inevitably must become friends because like, you know, it's just like that shared love. Um, and if the vibes are good, it's just, it's game over. Um, so, you know, it's crazy just to fast forward the clock up to the present and you're now doing all of these amazing shows. Um, you know, along the way you were, you know, I feel like a couple of years into the hundred, you had some, you were releasing remixes on SoundCloud some of those started to catch on you began touring you started a label called hot boy um 
doing, doing showcases and the pandemic hit and everything went on pause on your artist career. You went into crisis mode as a promoter. Um, I remember Brendan telling me like about all the initiatives he was trying to do to keep people safe, but also try to help all of the nightlife industry where so many people were out of work and just struggling. Um, and it's interesting because a few months ago, um, you mentioned having second thoughts about your artistic journey and, you know, your sort of like journey as like a DJ and producer. Um, and I, I remember you saying that you were thinking about giving up, but now it sounds like you're not like you're, you're feeling inspired. To, <laughs> to up again. <laughs> uh, well, no, yeah. See, like, I mean, I think that's common, right? Like, um, you run into roadblocks and it's easy to to kind of get discouraged. And I think that that's that happens in whatever stage in your career, whether whether you know where where whatever level you're at. Um like in you know 2014, 15, when they took away SoundCloud from us and the majors sued SoundCloud and forced everybody to go to Spotify and took away all the social following and and you know, blacklisted us. Um, like when that happened, you know, that was a very dark time too. During that time, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like I can just kind of focus on being a promoter and 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 try to do the best I can there. Um, and it wasn't until like when I came up with the 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 hot boy thing and the the idea of taking control again and 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 putting the ball in my court again and creating the brand and creating a way of interacting with fans and creating like a, a culture around the record label. That's what inspired everything to get going again. And that, that was like the peak of my career in 2019, um, 2020. Um, so then when all that got gone and everything got decimated, I really felt like it was like the most important thing I could do to focus on just being the best promoter I could when, the you know when the pandemic ended and we could start you know getting together again i felt like the world needed me to be a promoter it didn't really need me to be a touring artist or a, a musician again i felt like like the priorities needed to be taking care of the employees and making sure everybody had jobs and making sure that like the city was good um and and, and came back in a healthy way so I was having some time. <laughs> if it weren't for you coming over, forcing your way over my studio a year ago, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know if I would have fallen in love, fallen in love again with making music again and and getting back on the horse and and you know putting myself out there again because it's easy, you know, not a lot of DJs I feel like have. I mean, it's it's hard to have those roller coaster moments in your your artist path, like your artist you know, uh, I don't want to say career, but like, I guess career, like it's hard to have those big swings, ups and downs, you know, and it's easy sometimes when you are feeling like you're at your low, it's easy to walk away. Um, and sometimes you just need, you know, good friends like you and, and you need encouragement to, to remember what the point is of all of this. And, and that is really the music. If it's, it's like, it, no one is ever, even if they are successful, they're not going to love it if they don't love the music. It's like, even if they're temporarily successful, even if they're like a TikTok star for 30 seconds, even if they are touring like crazy and they have a gimmick and they have all these fans, they're not going to love their life if they don't, at the end of the day, love coming back to the studio, love being able to center themselves and love getting lost in what the art of the music really is which is ultimately should be an escape from all of this shit that we live in in the rest of the world so it's like uh you know every now and again we need to be reminded of that and and that's should be the reason that we always do everything that we do whether whether we have a day job or not whether it's full-time profession or not and um that's uh sometimes you just need that reminder when you're when you're when you're in the low and that's <laughs> that's something that I can thank you for when uh, you came over to my house a year ago. We were like, "Fuck it, we're getting the studio." And back. <laughs> so, you know, like uh, it feels very good to be back uh, producing again with, the, with the, the free time that I have, and uh, I'm I'm grateful very much so to you that um, just for 
for inspiring me again to, to get back on the horse and start playing shows again and start touring again and, and start making music again. Let's go, dude. And just to echo that, I mean, it's crazy. Recently, I messaged one of my favorite artists just being like, yo, I we had been chatting, but I was just like, yo, your music has just been so inspiring to me. And as someone I really look up to, who I think of as just like killing it. And they were like, thank you so much. I've been really down. I really needed this, like, <laughs> you know, sort of like, you know, pat on the back and every single artist who is making music from their heart and putting their spirit and, you know, everything into what they do. All of us go through those ups and downs at every single level. People who, whether it's friends of mine who are just in their you know bedrooms making music for fun people who are like on the main stages of festivals who everyone thinks they're you know they've got it made it's i think it's just part of you know art and the fact that it's such an emotional thing music for these ups and downs to happen and when you're low i feel like community and friendship are the most powerful uh things that we have and if anyone out there i, I love seeing the chat with people trying to connect because seriously like if you feel alone like this little container right here is an awesome opportunity to just yeah connect and i have i i feel like the, the connecting online for me has been so huge i have made so many friends virtually by just you know connecting over this passion and um, you do not need to be alone by any means. Um, we're all here for the same reason. Um, and it is late <laughs> for a lot of people. So, um, dude, so inspiring, Brennan. And I'm so glad that we're in it together. And dude, I just, one last thing that I would say for anyone out there making music, make music with the people around you, make music with people you can meet online. Um, collaborating is by far the best way to learn, improve, make music you never could have made by yourselves. And it's just like the most fun. And Brennan is, dude, I know, you know, he's here imparting all this wisdom. He is the man. He's a delight to be around. And that's why like, I can't stop making music with this guy. It's like when we just get together, it's just so much fun. It's like, we could be hanging out watching TV or doing nothing. But when we hang out, make music, it's like, it's just it's even better. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's unbeatable. So, um, really, really awesome. And I think on that note, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about some music stuff. Um, so Renan and I have made a bunch of music together. Um, we recently dropped a new song that just came out on Monday. Um, go check it out. Um, but, and we put out an EP of songs earlier in the summer um and this is like one of my favorite things about producing with other people i have been mostly producing stuff outside of house music these past few years and brennan as you heard him talk about house music is his like deepest love um in music and i grew up like my i guess earlier on in my dj career house music was everything to me and then i kind of just got you know just been exploring and it's not that i stopped liking it but I, when I got in the studio with Brendan, it was like, oh, damn, I'm going to make some house music. And I haven't done this in a while. And I haven't even made house music like this before, even though I've always loved it and still do. And just being pulled into a direction that you love, that you just might not have done on your own little, you know, groove, I just think is so awesome. And, um, you know, I think a big, when I sat down to make music with Brendan, there were a couple of things that were really important to me. One, I wanted to get a sense of what he was inspired by. And then two, I just wanted to have fun. <laughs> and I didn't want to like stress about like, is the song perfect or not? I just wanted to like fuck around. And one of my favorite ways to like fuck around and not stress too much about what you're doing is to sample. Um, we're both huge fans of Daft Punk and, you know, Daft Punk embodies this idea of like sampling, sometimes sampling a bunch of people songs of theirs like robot rock and um digital love uh harder better faster stronger are good examples of songs where it's like pretty much just a disco sample and maybe they sang on top or maybe they combined a couple songs or maybe they just put a disco sample with like a drum machine and called it a day and that is kind of you know how a lot of early house music began with djs 
finding a disco record and wanting to make it hit harder in the club. So they layered it with a drum machine um, or change the song structure to make it more uh, fitting for their DJ sets. So um, we started this like approach for making music that I hadn't really done before where we would spend time digging for music and put as many songs as we could into an Able Pro Ableton project and then see what songs fit together. <laughs> and um, it's in finding bits that we could sample and combine and so much fun. And so I'm going to show you uh, a bootleg that we have not released, but I posted it on my Instagram the other day, um, a Radiohead <laughs> the past few weeks, Brendan was like, dude, we gotta, we gotta mess with Radiohead's, uh, uh, everything in its right place <laughs> and I was like dude that song's really good um, and so we just downloaded like a bunch of songs I'll play a little video of the the track um, do 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 here is the song can you guys hear this give me a thumbs up if you can hear it Slaps, dude. <laughs> awesome so i'm gonna do a little track breakdown um but show how the process came together so the project itself is like a little bit more disorgan is you can't things are like shifted around let me open up an earlier version real quick um when we started it this is what it looked like it was some of the samples might have disappeared that is unfortunate but pretty much what uh what we did but so many samples all just like into one Ableton project and then would try to find combinations that worked. Um, and so some of these combinations that didn't, that didn't make the cut were like pretty random. Like we have uh, an acapella, we have like an instrumental section from a Phoenix song with Show Me Love. You got to show me love. you know, just trying all these different combinations and a couple of things that make this, you know, we, I, I, there was a lot of stuff that we didn't end up using, but just like threw a bunch of stuff at the wall and just like clicked around a couple of things. If you're, if you want to try this like approach, it helps to uh, just find the BPM of the song that you are uh, about to sample using like record box or Serato and you just type it in here find sections of the song where there's less elements playing. So if we click through, let's see if, there, uh, if there's any other examples in this project here. I feel like most of them are like inactive, which is pretty frustrating. Let me just open up the final version. Um, if you look at a waveform of a track, look at the sections of the waveform that are small. Um, also like intros and outros can be really good. Okay, here there's more stuff that's not deactivated. I'll show, um, I wonder if I can find one or two other uh, ideas that we did not use. I think this is one of them. Uh, let's see, oh, this one here. Yeah, this one was like another one that was really cool. You got to <laughs> and pretty much what I'm doing here is like, you know, uh, but finding finding a loop that feels, uh, I said the smaller sections or maybe like, I knew I want to use the show me love vocal, um, but finding like, you know, Brand showed me this like boogie song. It's like Evelyn Champagne. Um, she's awesome. Um, as like, find the intro where there's no vocals. Loop it. We had some other ones. Let's see. And we were trying all sorts of different combinations. You know. Just fucking around. And there, you know, it's like a lot of things can go together when you just throw 40 songs into Ableton and then like, you know, just play, 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 find the like one or two that like really click. Another thing that I do, I did like pitch the vocal. You know, so you can use this uh, pitch knob to get things into the right key. But ultimately, Brennan was very insistent about the Radiohead chord sample. 
And I, this is like, this Radiohead song is just so incredible. Um, and when we found that it works with the Show Me Love vocal, I was like, dude, what about these other disco songs? And it was kind of like, no, dude, I think it's just Radiohead for now. Um, I'm tired of giving my love and getting nowhere, nowhere. This is game over, like just so epic. Um, <laughs> and so like counterintuitive, but you know, a lot of the music we've been doing with this style has mostly been like very disco-y soul music, uh, you know, kind of house stuff. And so I was like, let's keep that going. And we found this OJ's song. Um, let me see if I can just play the original somehow. Uh, where's the button? Show in browser. Let's see. So uh, this might... Uh, that's just the bongo loop. I froze and flattened it. Um, OJ's, is this it? This might also be consolidated. Um, uh, I might just have to go. Where can I find it? Uh, regardless, it doesn't really matter. Here's the 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 main part of it that we used. This drum beat, and there's this vocal. And the coolest thing is when we played that vocal with the Show Me Love, there was this really cool call and response thing that started happening where when the, this is the show me love vocal, when it stops, the OJ's vocal starts. So I think I think that alone, that was like another moment where Brendan and I were probably like dancing around the studio, freaking out <laughs> and be like this. The, what just happened? Um, so fun. Um, and then with the Radiohead sample. And so, you know, we had dug up so many songs. I was like, oh, what about the violin? <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> what about the violins from Forgot About Dre? <laughs> so those are in there too. Um, here, let me turn off all this processing, but just so ridiculous <laughs> that Forgot About Dre is in there. Um, let's do it like this. And it's also funny because this also works with Show Me Love. <laughs> I guess it should be here. <laughs> it's not quantized, but just so silly. So that, I I felt like the, the violins, they are used kind of just as like a background rhythmic element to keep the, the groove going. And I do a lot of like filter automation to kind of make the track go up and down. You've got to show but so, yeah. And then also Brennan found this disco, another disco sample that was just like a string. So just like another little background thing. It's not that significant, but we were just like, it's like a fun game. Be like, how much stuff, how, how illegal can we make this bootleg? How many... Uh, songs can be like mashed together. Um... So cool. So um, in terms of like the composition, oh, there's also some like more disco samples. There's probably like a dozen songs that are sampled in this track, but the to make it a club beat, this is something that is so important. Whenever you're making dance music, a good kick drum and a bass line are the most important things to make people dance. And so for this bass line, all I did was followed the chords of the Radiohead song. Um, it's the same notes. I added a little bit of extra rhythm, um, but the, the pace at which these notes change from B to C to D is simply just following the Radiohead sample. And 
one of the sounds for my bass line um, is guitar bass. I use this preset all the time in Ableton. It's great for like French, like disco house type stuff. It's awesome. So that is a little bit of stock Ableton 909. Um, and that's the pretty much what makes up the core loop of the track. Oh geez, I'm triggering multiple things. And then for the arrangement, um, it was just a matter of sort of deciding which sound we were going to introduce first or which sample. Turn this off. Um, started with teasing these disco drums and the OJ sample. Another thing that I guess I didn't mention to build the tension, we used, um, uh, there's a vocal layer down here that's just looped and creates like another rhythmic idea that we can have the filtering go up and down. Without it, it's just this. But by having a filter on it, it's like, dude, sometimes you see production breakdowns and there's all these plugins. None of these plugins actually matter. I could turn all of them off. <laughs> and it's literally just this EQ. This is the only thing that matters. It going up and down throughout the track is what helps build so much tension. Same here. So just like, you know, this having this looped vocal with the filter coming down and the lead vocal playing by itself, just these two sounds, it creates so much tension. Um, and I love when you have very few elements, what you do with those elements becomes really powerful. Like this little filter move, so much like suspense. You feel like something's about to happen. Um, and that's, I do the same thing with the Dr. Dre violins. Um, and then Brendan and I had this like funny moment where I was like, dude, what if we threw in the synth from show me love and he was like no way and i was he's like it's gonna be so cheesy and i was like you're right but we gotta try it <laughs> and he was like no and uh i was like please just give it a chance and he's like okay fine which i think is a really really courageous move on his part he really took the risk of but i think that's it's a good approach if you're collaborating you can always do a save as and so that's what i did i was like i'll do a save as we can delete it if we hate it um, and I just opened up, uh, I use a plugin called Rave Generator, which is free. And there's an M1 organ sound that just pretty much immediately sounds like Show Me Love if you just play the notes. And so this is like, when I played this song out for the first time, it was like an insane moment to just hear, like you're listening for, you know, what is this? You know, three and a half minutes or so. Um, of, of like this you're hearing the show me love vocal but it's that iconic melody that like everyone like freaks out about So fun. And it was, it was interesting. One thing that Brennan really helped me figure out, I was trying to like keep this melody in with the radio head on the drop. And it, it, it like, for whatever reason, when we took it out, you, you know, it, it made it feel so much better. And I just love that. Sometimes it's like less is more, you know? And I think the idea of just having this sample in there, this like mel melody in for, what is this? 13 seconds, uh, <laughs> eight bars or whatever. Um, and then just taking it out 
um is like kind of a fun thing it's like fuck you we're only giving you a taste <laughs> and then it goes away it's like i don't know just kind of funny um funny to me so that is and beyond that the rest of the song is pretty pretty much just letting the the vocal do its thing verse chorus verse etc having kick and bass come out here uh having some of the different samples come in and out like we take the radio head sample out here And then it comes back in, radio head vocal out. Um, another thing that maybe some of you noticed, um, a big thing that I'm thinking about is like, if uh, if the show me love vocals out, can we add some uh, some other element to help fill the space? So I have the filter go up here. I can't put my no, just like little things like that. Um, how necessary is that? Probably not the most important thing, but um, it was super fun. All right, so that's pretty much that. Then everyone always asks about mastering. Here's our mastering chain. Um, it's just the stock Ableton limiter. Um, the other plugin, this I love this plugin. It's called Mini Meters. You can like see it's like a visualizer thing. I'll show it to you guys real quick because people will probably like to nerd out about that stuff. Um, let's see. Wait, hold on. Would you like to update now? So you can just like see what you're doing. Um, I think it's super helpful. There's the vocal. I've had more than my share. When the bass comes in, it's gonna get red. So I love looking, I'm very visual. I like to look at the pretty colors. Um, and that is the track. Um, uh, the song that we just put out, um, it's called Don't Know Why. Check it out if you'd like. Um, uh, we're gonna do a little bit of Q and A. Um, you can ask me and or Brennan, anything you'd like, DJ production related stuff, gig stuff, anything. Um, a couple quick announcements before we do that. Also, just gonna bump some links. Um, if you wanna do another free production workshop thing to keep the, uh, keep the vibes going. Um, here is like a little, another, I'm just bumping it. The, um, the 909 challenge, uh, we're going to do it Thanksgiving weekend. It's two days, super fun. And also, uh, I saw some people asking about like when I'm doing my next course, I am going to do a little intense boot camp. It's not necessarily for like, uh, it's all skill levels are welcome, but it's like, if you want to spend, you know, a good chunk of time producing music for, you know, four weeks of music, a couple of weeks of like more industry stuff. Here's a link to it. Um, and um, yeah, it's going to be, uh, dude, it's one of my favorite things I do all year. A lot of homies in the Zoom from it. Um, and we get to go in, we dive in, you get very sick of my voice. <laughs> we do hours and hours of like, you know, sort of like feedback sessions and lectures and that sort of stuff, but it's all wrapped in a very short amount of time um super fun i know people are asking about it so there's the link um and uh yeah if you want to sign up if you have any questions about it message me on instagram and uh uh yeah if you if for people who sign up uh for the class early i'm doing extra one-on-one -on -one sessions if you do it before the end of the month so message me with questions if you have but that's all my like boring teaching announcements beyond that here for all questions. Um, and yeah, also for anyone who's like, I don't want to take your class, come to the 909 challenge regardless. It's super fun. Uh, dude, one of my friends who did it um, got a song signed <laughs> from uh, like just this like free challenge. Um, another friend of mine, it was, I had never met her before, but she um, she does the free challenge. This is like a few years ago. I end up being like, yo, you made this awesome song can i sign it to my label fantastic voyage her name's Chupsy. um and then she ended up like getting booked for a bunch of like dirty bird festivals and like all this she's been releasing so much incredible music she's so talented and awesome but crazy shit from just like a fun weekend and it's always just like 
the more the merrier like love hearing like the crazy shit that people do and i try my very best best to listen to as many songs as possible so thanksgiving weekend um roll through if you're free and enough of my announcements let's dive in on some questions i think um maybe a good way to do the questions um why don't you comment them in the chat um i know people are already doing that um and so um if you are trying to ask a question to me brennan or both please specify that um and yeah uh <laughs> let's get after it okay <clears throat> so all right how do you approach separation of frequencies when mixing do you use hard eq slopes that are separated by a decent amount of frequencies um or just kind of hope sounds don't mess at the phase of one another say synth and a bass sound both sound good in the same frequency what's your thought process on how to proceed okay very technical question but very good question for me i try to do as little as necessary i have released songs that don't have any eq at all those songs often have like a drum machine and a vocal <laughs> and like nothing else the more sounds you have in a project the more you might need to use EQ to make everything fit. But to your question, you said like, if a synth and bass sound sound good in this and are in the same EQ like thing, if it's fitting without EQ, it might be okay. It all, this is something that very few people talk about. So much of technical mixing is dependent on your songwriting and your composition. If you have 30 melodies, you're going to need to do a bunch of shit to them to make them all fit. And it might not work because that's like so many ideas. If you have two melodies, you might not need to do very much. Um, the, the times that I think it's like more important to do it um, could be around um, making sure that your kick and bass have space. Um, but look, I you know, a lot of people, they'll say, cut the low end off every single sound that's not your kick or bass. Here's this chord melody from Radiohead. There's a lot of low end. I did bring it down, but I didn't, I felt like I didn't need to do this. You know. Obviously that like takes away too much. On my earbuds, I don't really notice that much of a difference. I thought this little scoop was sufficient just to give my bass a little bit more room. But the reason this is not an issue is because I matched the notes of the bass line to the chords. If these notes did not match, it would sound really, really muddy. Let's listen. Hold on, why my emoji keyboard? <laughs> Like this, it it sounds like a wrong note, obviously. Um, but so often people have an, an issue with with like their melodies working with each other and are trying to use EQ to compensate for that issue. Um when in doubt, you can just simplify your song and then you don't have to worry about this as much. And I think um I that, so, that sounds like an easy solution to make your song simple, but I think often it can be really hard to find a really good simple idea. Like a good example, a metaphor for this would be like <laughs> what I'm doing. Someone that, when you, you're having a conversation with someone and they're saying sentences and paragraphs when they could have just been like, I'm not hungry. <laughs> you know, sometimes like finding the concise iteration of what you're trying to express can be challenging so that's that's like i think my biggest piece of advice all right i know that was a super long-winded answer let's try to keep it going uh let's see i'm I, brennan I need, I need okay more for brennan yes i need to drink some tea uh but when promoting how do you identify an act that is marketable as it is quality how do you identify an act that is as marketable as it is quality it is really, uh, is it really as much about social media followers as some make it out to be? Great question. 
Oh, that's a great question. Um, it's a combination of things. Um, for me personally, I try to decipher between the two. There are certain things that are marketable that might sell tickets that might not necessarily be quality. Um, and that's going to differ in personal taste. There's a lot of things that I book that I know don't necessarily tell ticket, sell tickets, but I think are culturally relevant. And the best example, I think, in the country on a big scale of that would be like what Paul Tillett does with Coachella. Coachella sells out no matter what, and he dictates what's culturally relevant and what the lineup is and releases it after the tickets are already sold. So to take that on a small scale, um, there are acts that I'll book on a small level that I believe are very culturally relevant. I'm not necessarily worried about selling tickets for them. I think that they're important to come to Denver and they're important to break into the scene. They're important to introduce to people. And I'm not really necessarily worried about the ticket sales on it. And then there are other acts where I know it's just going to sell a lot of tickets per se. Um, and it's not necessarily because of, uh, it might be because they're very, very big on social media um, or have a very massive following because they they sell tickets because they're famous, not necessarily because they have um, really, what in my opinion, like super high quality records. So um, when it comes to like what you choose to book, um, that's going to come to personal preference. If you're booking, if you're always looking to just book what's going to sell tickets, then nine times out of 10, you'll probably be better off just work, booking something that's going to be famous or that a lot of people know. But that's not necessarily going to be in the same ballpark as something that's quality. Does that make sense? Great question. Great answer. Here's another one kind of follow up for that. Um, how important do you think EPKs are? Oh, man, I don't want to discourage anybody here. Um I've been throwing shows for 10, 11 years now, and I think I've thrown probably three or four or five or 6,000 shows <laughs> in my career. Um, and I have never opened up an EPK in my entire life. <laughs> for those that don't know, an EPK is an electronic press kit. That is something that like, you know, managers and agents would talk about um, and be, you know, your press shots and blurbs and your stats. Um, and yeah, I mean, Brennan, like do some, you, so Brennan does not use them at all or like does not look at them. It sounds like, um, do some people in the industry, like, do they matter? Like for, for other people, maybe, um, maybe not everyone, I genuinely ask um, for myself. Uh, so that's, so here's the thing. Um, I think an EPK can, um, be, be useful in the sense of, it can be useful in the sense of having all of your your info in one concise place, but um, I've never I've never read one. I don't think that I don't think it's like there's like this illusion where people are like, oh, you got to get your EPK together so that you can get a booking. I don't I don't believe that that that's necessarily the case. I think that um, if you if what what's more important is have have your shit together have all of your socials on one channel have all of your mixes have everything in line if you've got your if you have your brand together and your brand is easily followed then i don't believe that you need an epk like any like if your ig matches your soundcloud and your social links are all together and everything is one package and people don't have to look for you know five different things to try and find who you are then i don't believe an epk is necessary Awesome. 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 Um, okay, cool. Um, let's see. Uh, someone asked, how do each of us get over writer's block? So Brennan, shift gears as an oh, artist. <laughs> super easy. Um, you hire Justin Jay as your <laughs> producer and you let him do all the work. Uh, no. uh, writer's block is the worst. Um, th there is no getting over writer's block. It just, that you have to struggle through it and wait for it to go away. In my opinion, like, Sometimes uh, sometimes there's no forcing through any of it. That for me personally, sometimes I just have to do something different. And it, for me, I work a lot. So, um, and I'm sure that's uh, the, probably the case for a lot of people. Um, and so sometimes time away from the music is the best, the best solution, at, at least for me. I, I 
almost, it's very frustrating for me. And this is probably the same for maybe a lot of people can relate with this, but my time is pretty limited. So if I've got like a studio day and I'm like, this is the day that I get to write music, that can be really frustrating if I'm not feeling it. And so if I've got my seven hours on Sunday and I get to sit down to try and write music and I'm not feeling very motivated that day, that can be really devastating. Um, and there's not really a good way to get around that that I've found until I wait for the next Sunday. <laughs> yeah, um, dude, you know, for me and Brendan, you got to try this, dude. I feel like so often writer's block can be a symptom of two things. One, a symptom of you being hard on being putting yourself in a box being like i need to make a banger <laughs> and maybe that's not what your like actual like energy is maybe you want to like make a chill song <laughs> <laughs> always make a banger is only. <laughs> <laughs> only i know i know but but here's the thing even a chill song can be a banger in its own way <laughs> 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 and well played <laughs> you know dude you know it's like whether it's a speed, a BPM, a vibe, that sort of thing, that can be a big thing. Another issue that a lot of people face is struggling with quality. When you start getting hung up on how good or not good your song is, you can fixate in a way that can be so negative. And so often, if you spend a few hours listening to the same loop, you're going to think it sounds bad. Imagine listening think of the best song in the world think of like objectively what is the best song you might think um vanessa carlton a thousand miles you're like that's the best song ever if you listen to it for three hours you would definitely hate it <laughs> no matter what the song is even your own song if you listen to it over and over again you're gonna get tired of it and so to to mistake it to mistake that for like the song sucks I think is really bad. And then you can just get into like a, a downward spiral of being judgmental towards your song. If you, this is the ultimate way to bypass this issue if for that type of writer's block. When you're like, fuck, everything I make is horrible. <laughs> Give yourself permission or set an intention to make the worst or stupidest song you possibly can put farts in your song, like push it to the limit, put distortion on the master. That's like one of my favorite things. Like literally be like, I'm going to make the worst song ever. And hopefully while doing this, you can have a lot of fun. Like if you start putting farts in your song, you're going to start like laughing and be like, wow, this is like ridiculous. Like if you really do it, <laughs> you know, um, when we start shifting our mindset from like, how good is this? into like just being like let's have some fun let's fuck around that is when things can start to flow because you cannot create if you're censoring yourself if you're like no not good enough not techno enough not this or that you know you need to have permission to spew like in even in the project that i showed you guys today brendan and i threw so many ideas at the wall and we were like oh some of them were comically bad um and it was like never an issue it was just like we, we would laugh about it fuck around you know it's like you just keep on throwing stuff until you until you just chase your excitement your energy um and obviously what i showed today is like a little bit more of a complicated song but you know come to the 909 challenge in a couple of weeks and we'll see how like simple it can be um brennan you gotta you gotta roll through Saturday, Sunday, Thanksgiving weekend. I don't know. I feel like that's not a big party weekend after Thanksgiving. You would know better than I. So uh, by the way, I muted you. So you're gonna have to unmute. Um, I hope, uh, yeah, Roger's block. It, it, it's really normal. Try to make the stupidest song you can. Sample something stupid. These are all my personal favorite ways to grapple, to like overcome it and just know that it's very normal. All right, let me keep on reading through questions. Um, Someone asked, what's the best way to get signed to Dirty Bird? Um, they have a demo submission email um, or form, and then you just send as many songs as you can. Um, and never give up. Just keep on sending. I've gotten so many songs rejected by Dirty Bird. It's crazy. Um, probably, yeah, I don't know. I spent like, I spent eight months of my freshman year of college. I'd gotten 
one song like fluke signed to dirty bird took eight months of weekly rejection emails or just getting ghosted until i got another song signed there was a lot that i had to like learn in terms of production but um if you just don't give up don't give up it's crazy they will also have heard claude say if he sees the same artist in his demo inbox over and over again it actually does something beneficial for you because he's like wow this person's this person loves us <laughs> this person's so loyal like they're really inspired like that's it's it's a, a counterintuitive thing but it, it does work all right let's go to another question um uh let's see okay someone asked a question i fucking lost it um that was like i'm throwing parties and i'm trying to do uh a better let's see trying to improve on throwing parties where was it um someone from orange county if you're there let's see rob rob layton oh yeah rob good to uh, good to hear from you dude so brennan here's a question for you this is maybe someone who has been throwing parties i throw parties in oc and was wondering what i can do to improve my events i've been growing my email and text list i believe the talent and support acts i've been booking are great and i use void acoustics around parties is there anything that you would suggest i could do to improve my parties and bring in more heads um uh, that's it just depends on i guess the frequency in which you're throwing the events um i'd like to know i guess that's such a broad question i would i i would be able to help a lot more if i knew i guess more details of of the events um if you've already got great support and you've got a good sound system and i mean there's a there's a number of factors that could help um, if you've got good email and text lists, then it seems like your marketing is 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 solid. Um, one thing that I that I mean, outside of maybe booking bigger headliners or booking um, some booking bigger names to draw more more tickets, um, if you make something special, then more people will come. Like the 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 frequency of the events that you're throwing might be counterproductive if you're spreading out the amount of parties. Um, then and you're able to maybe consolidate. Um, you might be able to get a bigger return for your bang for your buck. So if you're trying to think, if you're like, okay, cool, I'm throwing ten parties in a total of three months and. I want to increase the amount of of people attending the parties. You could get away with maybe throwing five parties that are absolute bangers, and people can't get in, and then you create demand for more parties. So outside of maybe like uh, booking bigger names to bring in bigger tickets, if you're working on like a local level, um, I would consider potentially re maybe reducing the amount of parties that you're throwing and try to figure out some way, um, some angle of creating hype and creating um, the event to be special, whether that's um, highlighting perhaps a record that's getting released by one of the locals or making like a record release party happen, or maybe it's uh, some sort of way of, of tapping into the local community to make it something special about them. Like uh, one thing that, that does really well, like when we do like uh, here in Denver, when we do uh, takeovers for like a collective that's, that's um, happening here in Colorado um, or that, that is operating here in Colorado, a lot of people will rally for that because um, it's special. It doesn't happen that often. And so when we do like a, a, a local crew takeover of a night, uh, people come out of the woodwork for that shit because it's special against a lot of the big headliners that are playing, even though there's bigger names playing in the city at the time. So there's a, it, there's such a that's such a broad question. Um, so I hope I'm helping in in any way, shape, or form. But without knowing all the details, like uh, feel free to DM me or something, and I can I can I'll give you all the advice I, I possibly can on, on my end with with your specific situation. But just out the top, like I know that the the, the way to make things like pop harder is always try and figure out anytime you step out of your front door figure out a way of making the party exciting and special and and that can be by restricting the amount of times that the party happens or figuring out a way of differentiating your party from whatever else is going on in the city 
Dude, such good wisdom. Oh man. Um, and some, you know, I feel like kind of similar question might have like a similar answer or different question might have a similar answer. Can throwing parties in the same location each weekend decrease attendance size, even if it's an established event? That was like completely independent, independently written. Oh, um, no, absolutely not. It just it 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 actually weeklies can be really powerful. Like the power of a weekly can be stronger than almost almost anything like club events especially in the soft ticket world are the backbone of the culture um the reason is because when people find a home that they can go to every week they can find the same people there every week they can listen to the same style of music that they're attracted to every week that becomes this thing where they become regulars the trick there is to figure out the people that are your regulars and figure out how to treat them as regulars. Where people fuck up with a weekly and where people fuck up with a, a local community is they tax those people regularly. And that's where they fuck up. Where a promoter looks at somebody and they're like, they love this style of music, I'm gonna sell them a ticket every single weekend. Well, the backwards ass thinking there is instead of looking at, per at that person like they're a regular customer, they need to be taken care of like a regular, the same way somebody would go to a dive bar every single Friday where they go see that bartender and that first beer is free and then they buy the other beers, right? And they get taken care of and get hosted when they go to that bar. That generates other people that there are their friends that go to that bar every time that person walks in that door. So it's like the, the, the importance of a weekly is identifying the people that will come weekly and create an atmosphere that they can feel comfortable with going to a dance, to a dance club every single week and making it like their weekly bar and their weekly hangout. And that like, when you can tap into that, um, that person where they can walk in, they know the bouncers, they know the bartenders, they know, um, the, the people that are around, they know that they can expect to see friends there. When that happens, then you're creating an atmosphere that it becomes repetitious and they can't wait. That ends up being their, their, their safe place. That ends up being their home. And that ends up being something to look forward to every single week. And so you can program the same type of music and that same type of alternative uh, lifestyle to where when they have friends coming into town, those people go buy tickets. They're going to their workplace and they're like, you know what, like, fuck these coworkers, or maybe they're saying to their coworkers, no, 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 I go to this, uh, I go to this bar on Saturday night because I love the people there. And they end up being your biggest ambassadors. They end up being people that care about the night more than, than almost you do. So it's like, it's like identifying those people and taking care of them the way they should be taken care of is the is the priority there and if you can do that as a promoter and you can make all those people feel like that that treat them the way they deserve to be treated then they end up being um the weekly will be will be able to be like all of my other weeklies that have lasted for almost a decade now and haven't gone away dude and it's you know it's it's interesting because i feel like for the hundred, someone asked what benefits, someone just like their question was, what benefits do you like to provide for regulars? It's interesting because it sounds like the whole basis of the hundred was like building those regulars and treating them really, really well. And I, yeah, I don't know, like what's your, what's your take on how to treat those regulars? <laughs> Oh, no, the 100 still has all the same privileges of being the 100. They're still in free to any show that I do outside of like a, a hard ticket, like Live Nation show. So mm -hmm. they're still able to go into anything that I do for free. And, you know, they all kind of do their own thing and everybody kind of throws their own parties now. And, and that's been great too, because they're able to kind of curate their own experiences and throw their own parties. And it's, you know, crazy here in Denver, but at the, at the, at the core, it's like, you know, being able to know that at any given time they can always come back to one of one of one of my parties and walk right through that right that that door and, and be on the list and not worry about uh buying a ticket and so you know when you when it, to any promoter out there that's working like on a weekly event the strength of a weekly is building that community and, and building that that like home or that safe space for those people to know that they can walk into that event anytime and once a week and know that they've got a place that they can see like-minded individuals. Oh, dude. So awesome. Um, I'm trying to make my way through different questions. People were like asking about balls, balls, my song balls. I was literally at, I was talking to um, a student who was telling me, it was like, right as we were going to 
begin working with each other. And he was like, dude, I've just been having such a serious time. Like making music is just so hard and just like, uh, I could just tell it was weighing on him. And I was like, dude, music doesn't need to be like that. You can literally go into your headphones. I opened up Ableton. I was wearing these headphones, which have a mic and go balls. And then I just recorded that and made it into a song. And uh, <laughs> it's so fun. Um, and like, uh, <coughs> yeah, so that was a perfect example of like a song that I made to break writer's block. And then like John Summit a year later is now like playing it like almost every time he DJs right now, <laughs> which is crazy. Um, Everywhere. <laughs> having fun. It's so important. And even something you think is stupid could end up being a banger. Um, all right, <laughs> let's keep it going. Um, okay, I don't know what this question will say, but I will read it. Um, for both, as a DJ and producer, I feel that my mind state switched from hunting for underground artists and tracks to now spending time on the DAW. Is there any tips that you have for this on balancing both? Or has this happened to you? So yeah, I guess, Brennan, yeah, I don't know. How do you balance DJing versus making music? Oh, well, fortunately, I'm not gigging a whole lot. So it right now, so it's like, it's it's different for me at the moment. Um, when I am going to play a show or I am going to play shows, then I like to spend time digging, getting back in that mode. Um, but uh, the other side of it is like, I'm fed music all day long when I'm like, when I'm booking shows. So I'm always digging for music constantly. So for me um, personally, when I'm when right now I fight for studio time. So like during the weekends, I'm finally like spending my free time in, in the studio. And um, that that's happening on Sundays at the moment. So I uh, I carve that time out and the other six days a week, I'm, I'm always digging for music. So it's kind of lopsided at the moment for me. Um, and I don't I'm not sure when that will change, but. I, I wish in a perfect world, it was a lot more 50, 50. Mm. Feel you. Um, for me, it goes in waves and there's no right or wrong. I feel like chasing your excitement is like a good approach. And maybe, you know, I, I know a lot of people have like aversions towards producing. Maybe you're not having fun, experiencing writer's block, a cool way. Here's like a cool little thing that you can think about as you're digging. If you find a song that you think is really cool, but it's like, oh, you really, really love it, but you want something, maybe the song is too long and you want it shortened or there's some aspect of it that you want to change. You can drag that song into Ableton and make an edit, um, which is a great thing to do to make your DJ sets unique and to get more comfortable using the program and, um, can sort of like be a little bit of both where you're making something for yourself and that's like related to your digging. And dude, some of my favorite DJs like have all of these like VIP edits that like I will like, like, dude, there was, there were years. So I would just want to see eats everything DJ. So I could hear his like bootlegs of like all these songs that were not released. And then he released a bunch of them and I was like, sick, you know? Um, and sometimes the edits can be very simple and you're not changing much to the track. Other times it can be like a remix, no right or wrong, but that's just a little piece of advice. At the end of the day, it's okay if things go in waves or you don't make music for a little while or don't dig for a while, chase your excitement and your energy. We want to be having fun. And I think that is the number one priority. Um, John played balls at Hocus Pocus or Hocus Hocus, whatever it's called. I was backstage and everyone went off. Fuck yeah, Linda, let's go. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, okay, let's keep, let's see more questions. Um, duh, duh, duh. there was one that I saw that I really wanted to go. Okay. Um, Brennan, what are best practices for advertising your gig slash party DMS, group chats, how many invites per day per week, how many posts, how often, et cetera. How do you, how do you do it? Oh, personally, um, I think the most important way of promoting your show effectively is to be as organic as possible. Um, I think if you come off spammy um, or you come off too aggressive, um, that's like always going to turn people off. I think that um, especially like depending on 
it's different like if you're playing like an out of state show like ads will run and that's like an effective way of, of, of reaching people like depending on your fan base but if you're playing like on a local level like when i when i play like locally i i i maybe post like maybe two times or three times total i never um try to over over post um and the reasoning behind that is that if people fuck with you they're gonna fuck with you and they're they're gonna want to follow you on um they're gonna they're gonna care about what you do without you forcing them to care about what you do there's no way that you can um you can uh uh create those people to be a fan however the most important thing that i can say is know the difference between what a fan is and what a friend is and what i mean by that is a fan is somebody you don't know a friend is somebody you do know and what i mean that, that sounds so simple like oh, sorry for the dalai lama wisdom out here but what i mean by that is that sometimes people confuse that um when you're locally playing and when you're locally um you're locally gigging and let me give you uh, let me give you a quick example when i first started playing locally my first show I went to go play um, up in Denver. It was like one of my first gigs in Denver. I was with a tremendous amount of friends because we had just gotten off a cruise ship together. And so I go to play this show and um, I had like eight car groups with the people here um, with me. And so I go to play this little tiny dive bar and all of a sudden I show up with like 60 people. So it made me look like I've just got all these fans. <laughs> And so I go to play my little 45 minute set, right? And everybody's raging and everybody's supporting and they all have the best time because they want to cheer on, like they want to cheer on the fan or they want to cheer on their friend, right? And, and so the next time I went and played in Denver, very fortunately, it was a very special event. So a lot of people came. But then the next time I went and played two weeks later in Denver, about a third of those people were able to come. And then the next time I played in Denver, two weeks later, about 10% of those people were able to come, right? And so it wasn't like um, everybody could just come see you and support you all of the time. Your friends love you and your friends care about you. They want you to succeed. However, you can't mistake that uh, those people um, like are your fans. Those are your friends. They love you. If you can get them out to come support, that's fucking awesome. But you oversaturate yourself in the market. You play too many times. Your friends can only support so much, especially if, God forbid, they're buying tickets the entire time too, right? So when it comes to, um, when it comes to like, you know, the, the, the concept of one you're promoting and what is too much promotion, the most important thing that you can do, if you step outside your front door and you're going to promote a gig that you're going to play, you want to make sure that it's special, but you want to make sure that it's special for everybody involved. And if you do that organically, you can post a couple of times, but if you're out and about and you're going to other people's shows, you're supporting other, other DJs, you're out at other people's parties, you're out around town, you're doing everything, you know, you're very socially active in other people's, other people's uh, gigs, other people's shows, other, you know, just being as supportive of the community as you can. You better believe that that support not only, not only is going to come back tenfold, but other people are going to be talking about the time that you're going to come play too, right? And so, like, it, you don't need to oversaturate. It's not about how many people you can you can spam online that you might not know. It doesn't matter about how many people that you can group text. There is going to be this, like, thing that happens naturally if people want to follow you and want to support you, they, they can happen in a very organic way. And that's, to me, I think the easiest and best way to get people out to your shows. Because if you oversaturate how many times you're posting about something or spam too much, that's a way of turning people away if they're not your fans. And if they're, your fans are already out there, they're going to come regardless. So, you know, um, the, 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 I guess the long-winded short version of that is the more organic you can come across, the stronger the return will be when you're promoting your shows, especially on the local level. Dude, so awesome. Uh, dude, 
So much wisdom. Um, dude, I know that we're, we've been running a little late. Brendan, you could answer one last question. Yeah, one more. And then I got to go. My show starts in five minutes. Oh my God. That's so sorry. All right, dude. Um, if I, let's say I am, I'm a DJ producer in, and I want to like connect with like a promoter and like build a relate and like be like, Hey dude, I've been making music. I've been DJing. How would you like someone to reach out to you in that situation? Or how could someone reach out to their promoter in their city to like try to make a connection, you know, and, and get in there? There's nothing more exciting to me when I, as a promoter, than when I get hit up by people that, are artists in the scene locally that have their shit together. Nothing more exciting. When I have somebody approach me and it's a DM on Insta or it's an email or they come up to the club and they're like, hey, my name's so-and-so. This is my artist project. And these are the records I'm releasing right now. This style of music that I like to play and these are the artists that I would love to play with and this is my game plan and this is where I want to go and this is uh, what my goals are. There is nothing that makes me more excited as a promoter to work with people like that. Um, the most confusing, not confusing, but the most exhausting thing as a promoter to work with artists locally or any, uh, even not locally, is when people come up to me and they're like, I just want to play big shows, or I just want to play, I, the, the, they come up to me and they're like, I really want to play in front of Dennis Cruz, because that's my favorite artist. And then two days later, they're like, I really want to play in front of Above and Beyond, because that's my favorite artist. And it's like, sonically, that makes no sense. You're, you're completely, absolutely fucking in two different fields why are you like make sense like i as a promoter it makes um it, it makes everything easy when everything is a package and everything can be placed in a position to succeed so when you're a promoter at your promoter like me where i might have 40 shows that month i don't necessarily have the time to teach every single artist how to succeed but what i can do is when people have their shit together and they're like these are the records I'm making. This is the style of music I love. This is the lane that I'm in. These are the type type of shows that I can do well at and perform well at. And this is this is this is what makes sense. Then I can go, cool, thanks to the email. I got this show, this show, this show. And I can give you a four-month plan on how to grow your followers and your fans up to this point already right in Denver. And in six months, you'll be doing your first local headline show. And so it's like I like building plans and working with artists that are on either the local level or the even the not local level having their shit together and having their brand together and their package together and their music together all in a concise way is the most exciting thing for me but when it's sporadic and it's just somebody it's like i love the dj and here's my instagram that is where it's just like you know um that's where it's cool like hit up my assistant and just let him know what kind of style you make music you like to play and you know definitely try and keep you in rotation but there's you know um i don't know how to build a plan for you because i don't have time to teach everybody right so for me it's like when people have their shit together i am i've got i've got like a handful of artists in denver right now that do have their shit together and it's the funnest projects on the on my side of things to use all the power i can as a promoter um to 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 build and that's something that I'm super pumped on. And it's like, I can use my resources and my marketing power and my social media and my Instagram and my headliners and my booking power and everything that I have on my tools for my national artists that I use to also give those tools to the local artists as well and help springboard their careers. So that's the best way I can put it. Like when I, when somebody wants, uh, like they want bookings, have their shit together and I'm, I'm ready to go. And that there's nothing that excites me as a promoter. More. That's cool. That's dude. Awesome. Um, and, uh, yeah. And I guess like on a personal level, it's just like friendliness and like good vibes. Oh yeah. Don't be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, don't be, you know, there's that's the other thing. This world is far, far too niche and far too small to have an ego or be be a prick. Like um kindness and and humility and hard work and and you know uh, being a being a, a good person is goes a long way. And um the, the other side of that is you've seen the antithesis of that. You've seen people that succeed and go very far and then you find out that maybe they're not necessarily good role models or they're not good people and you've seen how far they could fall too. So it's like um you know the the it never hurts to to be kind to everybody no matter whether they're the most powerful promoter in the game or they're uh, uh, another uh small DJ just starting out because every everybody in every step of the ladder whatever if there's an imaginary ladder to climb every single rung along the way um never hurts to have friends every step of the way so you know the, the the good vibes that you can put out will always be reciprocated dude unreal brendan on that note i know you gotta go i will be, everyone unmute when I say so and make some noise for Brennan, I'm going to hang out for a couple more minutes, but Brennan, thank you so much. You're the man, the wisdom. It's crazy. You are the man. Unmute. Make some noise. Let's go, Brennan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, yeah. Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate you guys. Yeah. The time. Yeah, yeah. Just Take care, guys. Fuck yeah. Um, all right. <laughs> uh, guys, one last thing that I think would be super useful, but I also just want to comment on what Brennan said. You know, I think like in terms of style and stuff, a lot of artists ask me about like finding your sound and like having to choose your genre and st stuff. You know, I think like with what Brendan's saying with this example, going from Dennis Ferrer, who like would pretty much only play house music to above and beyond, who would pretty much only play trance. Like obviously that contrast is pretty stark. However, I think Brendan would agree with this. Like there are a lot of artists myself and there's like a whole scene where certain DJs do play a, eclectic sets, you know? Um, and I feel like, that for me artistically has been super interesting. Like, you know, I feel like, you know, someone wrote Mall Grab, for instance, perfect example. You could hear everything from techno to trance, house, UKG, breaks, drum and bass. You know, I feel like there is a lot of room nowadays to take different genres together, take your own inspiration, find your own unique combination that is you um and i think uh you know i think like the key is how can you be the most you and then not confuse brennan <laughs> or your local promoter with like asking for people who don't make sense you know so and i think also as an artist i think it's really good to not feel the need to put yourself into the box when you're still exploring and I think it's so important to just keep on having fun because who knows, like, you know, it could be like for me, I was doing a collaboration actually with a student that uh, won a, won a challenge. Um, and we ended up making a dubstep song. I'd never made one. We did it. It was super fun for me. And then John Summit, once again, started playing it. <laughs> and then like Subtronics and all these dubstep people. And it's just like, I am not a dubstep artist, but I started playing like a good amount of dubstep now. It's like, you know, I think, I think there are, there is so much room for discovering your unique identity and the combination of influences. Um, and I think there is a scene out there that is representative of this fuck the genres, bl blur it all together. Um, you know, Nikki Nair, uh, you know, who I can't even think of like, people off the top of my head but yeah. it's 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 out there so you don't i don't i just don't think people need to like put themselves in a box um before we wrap one last thing i want you guys to quickly comment if there's one thing that you're going to take away from the the session today that you want to like keep in mind drop it in the chat what's a, a takeaway if you have a couple that's fine too but take a second comment in the chat what's something that you really 
want to remember going forward from this. So I'll kind of keep my eye out. Let's see. Hold on. Okay, sweet. This is awesome. Have fun with it. Create your own community. Treat your regulars like family. Make the music experience organic. The sampling approach. Be a good person and get your shit together. Fart noises, aka listen up, keep it fun, be yourself. Be authentic. Do not put yourself in a box. Chatting with folks and going to events help figure out local scene. Being authentic. Uh, uh, writer's block techniques. Find the family and shake the work up. Do not get discouraged. Make music and farts in it. Yes, farts. <laughs> friends are friends. Fans are fans. And hopefully fans become friends. Um, uh, I think that's the whole idea of a regular, you know? Um, Ricky, uh, don't stop. Keep moving. Stay humble. Be you and keep sharing, connecting. Fuck yeah. Kevin, uh, create scarcity as well as community. Build community strategically. Keep it real and keep it fun to keep going. Be authentic. Have fun. Okay, this is awesome. Um, one more thing. So I think this would be really fun to do. Um, I'm going to try to do this as efficient, like in a, I'm going to do it for just a moment, but I want everyone drop your socials, your Instagrams. And if you want to share uh, a, like, you know, some music, SoundCloud link, like drop all your shit, just do it. Um, and uh, if anyone wants to share songs, um, I'll click on a few songs before we wrap and just play a couple of people's songs just to like, uh, share, share the love. Um, and, uh, I'm only going to play, I'm just going to open a bunch of SoundCloud links and I'm only going to play each song for like 15 seconds, um, and see how far we can get. Um, but send, send songs. Okay. We got Zegan. We got Jim Raves. Good to see you, Jim. Eddie, I got you. Um, Eddie, put a put a song instead of a profile for this exercise, but I'm glad you dropped your, your link. Um, Christopher, I got you. We'll do like a couple more. Polly Kim, what is up? Oh, that's an Instagram. If you have a SoundCloud link, drop it. Uh, let's see, Jacob. Let's see. Celebrate. Okay, cool. Um, all right, John, boom. Uh, okay, that'll do. I've never done this before with like a big Zoom, but I think it could be fun um, and just a way for people to like kind of catch each other. And if you hear, I feel like, you know, I feel like uh, if someone makes a song that you like, you should shoot them a message and say what up. Because I think, um, you know, this is like, I feel like going to be a really good way to, you know, actually get a sense of like who who's here who stuck around for two hours <laughs> um all right here we go oh lex gonna oh wait yo lex your link didn't work just a heads up um uh it might have needed to be like a private link um okay house cats dude good to have you guys in the mix bailey i got you we'll do a couple more try to do as many as I can, but I'm only going to play each song for just a sec because um, we don't have the most time in the world. Uh, so I just clicked Nug Supreme. Your link didn't work. Um, let's see, a couple more because I, I want to do as many as I can. And uh, that's an Instagram link. All right, I'm going to do one more. Okay, sweet. All right, you got, so a couple things as I play people's songs. Um, I'm going to do my best to just skip around and try to find like, you know, a moment that shows the song. Can you guys do me a favor? And I need, give me thumbs up if you're down. Can we create a positive environment in this zoom room and fire each, each other up? Cause this might be people's first songs, a work in progress. And one kind comment could make that person's day. Let's blow it up with positivity here. Give me thumbs up if you're down. Fuck. Yeah. Fuck yeah, I'm scrolling through. Awesome. Okay, sweet. Amazing. All right, let us begin the chaos. And I apologize, but I can't play everyone's song in full. I'm going to do just like a few seconds of as many as that I, that I can do.
platform is. Uh. Planted They experience learn. Planted They experience learn. Celebration. Community. And wow. creativity. He's so on brand. <laughs> These elements intertwined. Act as a catalyst. Not just elevating the quality of life. Okay. I feel bad cutting that one short. That was awesome. Great. That that message. <laughs> the DJ mix nothing wrong with that but was looking more for original songs damn so sick I'm a, I'm a bust it. I'm a hit I'm a have to bust the click do it like that Great album artwork. Banger. Yes. Uh, glad we got some drum and bass in there. So sick. Diego, I'm assuming that was you. I'm glad you popped up on my screen. 
Pause. Love the range of styles here. A couple more. He has some proper dub. what this is <laughs> sick <laughs> fuck yeah dude that vocal is crazy sounding everyone unmute make some noise give it up for everyone who shared music give it let's up go you guys are so awesome thank you all so much for sharing that was vulnerable dude insane like see this is like what's so cool about for me doing this stuff like you know getting to hear just like all these amazing you know artists making great music and you know giving people the chance to connect with each other. So please do not uh, let that opportunity slip through your fingers. But also, uh, we're running it back in just a couple of weeks. 909 challenge. Um, uh, let me, I'll just bump that link in case anyone wants to RSVP. I'm sure like people will be able to find it though. But regardless, thank you all so much for coming out, sticking around. And um, yeah, I hope you, have fun making music. It's literally, that's the only thing that matters. Enjoying it, having fun. If you're enjoying it, great things are going to happen because, yeah, I don't know. If you are enjoying making it, someone might enjoy what you made Um, versus if it feels like work or a chore. You no, know, it doesn't need to feel that way. Um, And then with touring and gigging, um, I hope you have some insights. And, and I, I think... The biggest takeaway for me hearing Brendan talk about this stuff, the power of personal connection, you know, like not networking, but like when you find someone who likes the same music, connecting, not treating them like a fan, but like a friend, you know, and how Brennan did that on a crazy, in a crazy way with getting a hundred people together <clears throat> and it grew to like him throwing thousands and thousands of shows, <laughs> booking like the disclosures and the Carl Cox's and Jamie Jones and all, like every big DJ he's probably booked. It's crazy. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just so, it's so wild what can happen when you approach things from a place of love and sincerity for the music itself. And so, yeah, on that note, hope everyone has a great night and I'll talk to y'all soon. All righty. Thanks, Thanks, Justin. Thank you, Justin. 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 You guys are awesome. Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks. Have a great night. Have Let's a great go. Night. Yeah. Thank Thank you. You. Yo, it's after Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Bye, Justin. Night, everybody. Bye, Justin. Peace.